when Mike asked me to speak, I'm like, yes, I'll do it. He's like, what's your best topic? So I sent him a couple and then I created a new one. <laughs> and honestly, I've been talking to some folks, this cake is still baking. And what I'm sharing with you today is something that has been drilling down in me. And I have more clarity about what I want to do, what I want to be when I grow up after diving into this. So this is a safe place. And I felt like, yes, we can do this. Full transparency though, I almost didn't do it. I, once I knew Eugene was gonna be here, I'm like, I, I, I don't know. But I was in the shower one morning, not thinking about Eugene, but just, <laughs> but just going over this saying, you know, should I do this, shouldn't I do this? And I got a little misty, and this is why. I went to Eugene's workshop, and it was amazing. And I try not to get emotional when I talk about it, but we did some deep work and he helped me unpack some things in my life that brought me clarity to another level. I saw his face and he was smiling and he was nodding. It's like, yes, the student is learning. I saw your faces. I saw Linda, I saw Rhea, I saw all the folks in my group. And I realized this is a safe place for me to launch a new piece of content because in love, you'll help me but we all have to give birth to things, right? So Eugene, thank you for helping me get that clarity. I am ready and stoked to share with you what has been happening in my life. They say you need to teach what you need to learn. And truly, I have needed to learn what I'm about to discuss with you today. A little bit of background about me. Mike was right, I worked in NASCAR for 15 years, building high performance teams, pit crews for drivers like Jeff Gordon, Jimmy Johnson, multiple championships, multiple race wins, multiple pit crew awards, multiple pit crew championships. It was the life. So I thought I was a champion. But what if I told you I felt whew, like an imposter? For 20 years, <laughs> coach will appreciate this. I struggled in high school sports. I was a great defensive player. I was a baseball guy to the core, Yankees fan. That's why Lauren Johnson is like, I wanna be her, right? She lived out my dream, but I struggled offensively. I went to a no-name college without walls to get my degree. I coached at a this small division three Catholic college, right? No budget podunk college. And then I end up at the highest level of NASCAR working with the most famous driver in the world, at least in the United States, Jeff Gordon. When Nelly mentions you in a song, you're pretty famous, right? And the most successful team in NASCAR. I felt I was going to be discovered as a fraud. And that set in motion 20 years of living like an imposter. I would tell my wife, I don't feel like I belong. I haven't done enough. I shared this story with her because I was rehearsing and doing my thing with this, with this new pivot. And when I told her that story of the imposter, she almost broke out in tears. She's like, how did I not know? Because we can live successfully and still have limiting beliefs. And my kid on it when he was giving me a hard time, but yes, limiting beliefs. So I had to dive into what was happening. My coach and I, about the turn of, of, of the year, we were on a call and, she, and we were talking about branding and that's really how I was like diving into Mike Kim and like, what is my personal brand? And she's like, Matt, you know, we were having this conversation. She's like, you are not embracing your NASCAR journey. And I felt like NASCAR's corny, no one likes it. And she said, it's a slap in the face to God if you do not embrace your journey. She goes, do you have something heavy in your garage or something like that? And we coach very similarly. I'm like, yes, coach, I have a 35 pound kettlebell. She's like, what I want you to do is grab that kettlebell and carry it around all weekend because that represents the extra weight of your unbelief that you're carrying around. It was New Year's Eve weekend, gang. <laughs> and like a good student, like I would expect my coaching clients, I carried that bad boy kettlebell to my friend's house, New Year's Eve. Showed up at the door, you should have seen their faces. They were like, they know I'm in the coaching space, personal growth space, they're like, okay, I said, hey, it's a coaching thing. I carried it around 
all weekend. Guess what? Nothing changed. <laughs> Nothing changed. See, beliefs were abstract to me. Beliefs were abstract to me, right? This, this famous Gandhi quote, right? Our thoughts, our beliefs drive our thoughts. Our thoughts drive our words. Our words drive our actions. Our actions drive our habits. Our habits drive our values. And our values create our destiny. They become your destiny. So if I could change my belief, I could change my destiny. But it was abstract to me. I couldn't wrap my mind around belief change. And we, we talked about it yesterday. Like motivation isn't enough. So I had to dive deeper into what was happening to the brain, to my brain to understand why I wasn't having the success I needed and why I was stuck in neutral. Then I had a complete mind shift. And I have to thank Eugene for this because we did this deep work and it brought into focus all the neuroscience that I've been studying about performance and you know how the science behind performance is Im impacting your performance, et cetera. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to know more. I'm a lifetime learner. And during this journey, I discovered this, that I was confusing desire for belief. Like you can be successful with desire, with the hustle, with the grind, with the grit. But if your desires and your beliefs do not match and they're incongruent, you will not be as successful as you can be. And my goal in life is to live out my fullest potential. So let's dive a little deeper into this. I wanna put my NASCAR spin on this. NASCAR race cars go 200 miles an hour and have 700 horsepower. Jim, don't answer this. But what does it take to get the power from the engine to the wheels? What does it take? Okay, Jim, you can tell him. Torque. What? Torque. Torque. Okay. Drive train. Drive train. Okay. Fuel. Fuel. It takes a transmission. Mm -hmm. It takes a transmission. Now, how many types of transmissions are there? Just very basic. Two, right? What are they? Manual. manual. Who's, who drove in a manual or a standard before? Change the gear. <laughs> but you're constantly doing the work, right? Automatic. Put the key in, right? Stacy, push the button, the fob it, <laughs> right? And my Lexus, right? Put it in gear. You put it in gear. You go and you come back. But here's what they have in common. They both change gears. Yeah. Gears are happening. So let's take a look at this. The manual transmission is your conscious mind, right? And basically this is where we are looking at setting goals, uh, creativity, thinking abstractly. It's where our short-term memory is housed. And guys, listen, side note, I will give you this deck. Don't worry about taking notes and taking photos. I will give you this deck so you can just hang out and we can have some fun here. It has, un, it has limited processing power and it's the home of our desire. Now let's talk about the automatic transmission. This is the subconscious mind. And that's where change has to occur. In the subconscious mind, right? It's where we keep the database of our experiences. It's where the habits, the systems run, right, Vin? The systems run subconsciously. Vin's a psychotherapist deep into this stuff. It thinks habitually and it thinks literally, very detailed. And it knows the world through the five senses, right? What are the five senses? Sight, sound, feeling, kinesthetic, taste and smell. That's how the subconscious knows the world. And it's where our belief system hangs out. So now that we've got that lined up, we can understand that our brain is the ultimate horsepower and our beliefs are the transmission that apply the speed and power. I was like, okay, I need to dive a little bit deeper into this. So let's talk about belief formation. Remember beliefs were abstract to me. I couldn't wrap my mind around it. Now I'm a person of faith. So I get the belief and I, you know, I'm known in my circles as a mindset coach, 
but still working through understanding what was happening at a deeper level, let's talk about the belief formation here. There's environmental events. The brain is taking in 40 million bits of data every second. I don't want to get deep into this, but then it filters out the things that it thinks is important, right? So it looks at these environmental events and it makes an interpretation of that event. Uh, of that event. And the brain is always searching for meaning. Believe it or not, your brain is actually lazy. It is. It's trying to conserve itself. After that interpretation, there's a physiological response, right? 50 trillion cells in your body are communicating all the time. And that physiological response is based on the interpretation, which is based on the database, right? So after that makes that interpretation, it's like, let's store it to memory. And people can have the same event and interpret it differently. Rhea and I could be taking a walk, strolling, hiking somewhere. We see a bear. Rhea's like, ah, I'm a city girl, no way. Oh, I could be like, oh, that's my pet bear, Bobo. <laughs> same event, interpretation differently. Different physiological response, right? And then what the brain does, it looks for reinforcing events. Sean talked about yesterday, the brain likes patterns. It creates those patterns, right? It's a super filter looking for the same things. Reinforcing the original event makes that interpretation easier. And then what happens is the cells begin to crave that physiological response. And that's where I want to dive just a little bit deeper for a second here. It's the physiological response because I was like, I need to understand. I need to know more. Got a tennis ball? Grab a tennis ball if you got one at your table, at your reach. Our cells are like this tennis ball. They have structures on them called receptors. And if you look at the nap or fuzz of this tennis ball, they're shaped different sizes, different lengths, different angles, etc. Now within the body, there are 200 plus known neurochemicals that I'll call, you're not throwing it at me, Stace. 200 plus neurochemicals that I'm gonna call the juice because I like science for dummies, nice and simple. So we have that physical, physiological response and the cells communicate and it sends the juice to the cell. They connect whatever that flavor of the juice is, satiety, calmness, confidence, peace, anger, rage, our emotions. And they connect. Once they connect, that flavor is dumped into the cell. So our beliefs are happening at a cellular level. And I was like, all right, I'm digging this. I'm getting it. So the interpretation, I'm building these pathways. I have to rewire. I have to figure this out. So a little bit deeper dive here. When that flavor happens right? It dumps it into the cell and it creates that easy pathway for it. So what I want to dive a little bit deeper into for a second here is who read the book Quantum, uh, Quantum Success, right? And this is a little bit of shout out to our, our quantum physics, quantum success people. I didn't understand energy either. Our cells vibrate, giving off energy or our vibe, right? Interestingly, the neurochemicals, the juice, they vibrate at a certain frequency. When those frequencies match, they connect. So think of it like this. Any musicians in the room? I know Mike is, former worship leader, guitar player. You got two identically tuned guitars in the same room. E-A-D-G-B. I'm a wannabe guitarist. I haven't mastered it yet. I don't know if I've dedicated enough time, but I love guitars. When you strike the E string, the E string on the other guitar will vibrate. Energy, that's our energy. That's what people feel. I was like, okay, that makes sense because we talk about energy as this like, ooh, woo, woo stuff. And Mike calls our, our group the woo, woo group, right? <laughs> and we are the woo, woo group. We talk about psychedelics, micro dursing, you know, we keep it, you know, PG, but we just, we're, we're open. Like we're just talking about this. And I was like, okay, that makes sense to me. The vibration. Now, frequency and vibration. The juice also has its own frequency and vibration. 
So when the cell and the juice vibrate at the same frequency, they connect. Now that dance is the emotion. When they connect and the flavor's dumped into the cell, that's the feeling. Now the dance or the emotion could be experienced consciously or subconsciously, right? Because you could be stressed out. Eugene will tell you in a heartbeat, survival state, executive state, you can be in survival state and not be aware of it. Then you're like, oh, wait, why is my heart racing, right? We talked about HRV yesterday with, with Ellen. Um, and it's running in the background. But when the connection happened, the feeling, that happens at the conscious level. So for me, that's how I put it all together. So how do we change our beliefs? Because that's what was important to me. How do we change our beliefs? How do we think like a champ? How do we get our beliefs and our desires to align? Number one, we have to get clarity on the trauma, the event, the untruth that we are holding. That's what Eugene did for me. And if you were on the call, I came back from that like deep walk. I went back to my high school self, put my arm around myself. I was in tears and could barely talk to the group because it was so powerful. But I got clarity. Then I got clarity on creating a new vision or image of myself, replacing that one with a new one. And see, the brain can't tell what's real and what's imagined, right? So you have to get clarity. Then you have to honor yourself. Honor your experience. Honor your journey. Stay out of the hot seat with God, right? If you're a person of faith, you get it. If not, it's all good. We are all part of some divine energy. I happen to believe, and it happens to be the big guy, but we have that divine energy. When you embrace the story, you embrace your story, you're honoring yourself and what's happening at the cellular level. Boom. Oh, confidence. I believe in myself. And it's making it easier for those neural pathways to say, you know what? I got this. Because the brain is so powerful, you're not going to overcome it at the conscious level. That's what tiny habits are doing. At that subconscious replacement, right? We have to use affirmations. There's a ton of affirmations in the Quantum Success book. Mike did a great job. He's like, you know what? I'm not reading all these things. And I love Mike's directness. He's like, I recorded all those, all those bad boys and I play them on loop. He made a playlist and, and, and did all the affirmations so he could hear himself with these affirmations. And this is where true change happens. You have to affirm yourself with empower, uh, empower, empowering, truthful images, visions, and words. That's how we access the subconscious. And we use it by using the big three, right? That's how you have true change. Visually, what will I see? Right? You close your eyes because your mind can see the success. I can see myself speaking to 10,000 people. I can see myself going to the grocery store and people thinking I'm handsome or I'm beautiful, right? <laughs> Whatever that new truth is, you can see yourself. What do I hear people say about me when I reach that goal, when I have that new truth, when I have that success? Michael, you're amazing. Your dream stuff is phenomenal. You're right. What am I hearing people say? What am I hearing myself say? When I talk about mindset, I talk about voices, choices, and habits. What voices are you hearing in your head? They need to be positive, right? And then what, do, what will I feel? What is that feeling? Sean touched on it a little bit yesterday. Talking about images and feelings. If you can't say, you know, I, don't, I, I can't get that confident feeling. You can go back at a time in which you were super confident, felt beautiful, felt strong, felt in control. Tap that and attach it to this current truth, to this current belief, right? See, the subconscious mind needs specifics. Someone define happiness for me. 
So an affirmation that says, I want to be happy. The subconscious is like, what the heck do you mean? What, what, what do you mean you want to be happy? What is the truth that someone... Let, let's do for a second. We, we've got a little time here. What's the truth that you, would, that you hold to be true or you want to be true? Successful. Vince, come on. I'm going to put you on the spot, right? For success? Yeah. Uh, I'm successful when I own my own farm. Okay. Specific. Let's get more specific. What does that look like? Being able to travel when I feel like it and being able to work when I want. Okay. I'll use Mike. I'm, I'm kind of making an implication here. When Mike's like, I can take a month off of my business, I would think that he thinks that is part of being successful because he can shut it down for a week. That's very specific. Happiness is not specific. The subconscious mind needs to be specific. So when you write your affirmations out, make sure they are specific. Be very specific when you use your affirmations. <clears throat> monitor the input, right? The M. You've got to monitor the untrue self-talk. Our words are a contract with the universe. Ashley, are contracts hard to break? Not if you're on it, but anyone else? <laughs> they're, not, they, they're, they're easy enough to break and, and get yourself in trouble, but they're not hard to you just answered the question. You don't have to give me the lawyer answer. Like, are contracts hard to break? For the most part, yes, contracts are hard to, to break. They take work. The subconscious mind is creating that contract with the universe of, I'm not smart enough. I was an imposter. Matt, you're, you don't measure up. You don't have the experience. You're going to be found. You're, you're experienced D3 college. I'm coaching professional athletes, and I'm, like, trying to do this thing. That, that like, constantly being discovered was a burden that I was carrying. And I finally got free from that. So monitoring the input. Gang, listen to me. Monitor the comparison. You have to stop the comparison. I finally come to reconcile this. Everything everyone knows, everything everyone knows, I said that wrong. Everyone knows everything that they learn, right? They learned it first. I'll use Eugene because he's a good guy, even Vince. These guys are super, super bright. PhD in pharmacy, Vince, master's psychotherapist, right? A lot of study, a lot of book time. Guess what? They learned it. So I can walk around them and feel confident. Now, I want to learn from them, but I don't have to hold my head low and say, oh, man, they're so smart. I'm not. Because they learned it. Stop the comparison. Skills are learnable. Knowledge is available. And beliefs are changeable. So make sure you stop the comparison. Because what happens when you compare, we've got the physiological response, the neuropeptides or the juice, that flavor of I'm not good enough is on repeat, is on repeat. So when you compare yourself, when I compare myself, and I'll use Lauren Johnson because she's awesome. I'm like, man, she's freaking Yankee. She's crushed it. Like everything. What I'm saying is I'm devaluing myself. And the subconscious is like, oh yeah, that's right. You're not. It's fighting that battle. Consciously, I'm like, I'm going to get it. The subconscious is like, nah, you're still comparing yourself. So we have to, we have to monitor the comparison. And then finally, I'll wrap with this. We have to practice forgiveness and gratitude. We have to forgive ourselves first. Some of us may have experienced some very deep trauma. And a lot of times we think it's our fault. It was my fault of this. I, I was responsible. I was to blame. You have to release yourself from the blame. It's not your fault. We have to forgive others. We do not know other folks' journey. We can't harbor unforgiveness. We have to release the unforgiveness and let it go. 
then we have to practice gratitude daily. Mike has been big on us like, hey, get the, get the, get the gratitude journal, get the gratitude journal. How many of you are practicing gratitude like hardcore daily right now? Ooh, I love it. How many of you are kind of hit and miss? I'll journal a little bit. That's, that's, you know, I'm four or five days out of the week, but you have to practice gratitude daily. And this is why when you practice forgiveness and you practice gratitude, it rewires the neural networks. Remember I said the brain is lazy. It likes patterns. It likes things that are easy. That's what gratitude does. That's what forgiveness does. It's like, oh, it makes me easier to forgive. I don't hold grudges. I'm grateful because there's always something, even in the most crappy day, to be thankful for. And the subconscious is like, you know what? I'm going to be happy today. I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to find gratitude in what I'm doing. Change your beliefs and you will change your destiny. I appreciate your time, guys. I love this room. I love this family. Hit me up. That's my contact info. I will email you the deck if you're interested so you can have it. But thank you for your time. I appreciate you guys so much.